the story of Western art is the figure. And it's very easy to overlook that. Everett didn't overlook it, and a few of us didn't. Well, the conventional wisdom is that uh, if you're good enough, you'll be known. But it takes a bit more than that. Everett is one of the major artists of the region, and his reputation is sort of buried. This is very good, interesting wood. I like to go across the grain, I always do. Well, some people just go around the corner just to this thing. Everett Dupin was a sculptor, a teacher, and a father. As a professor of art at the University of Washington, he influenced generations of Northwest artists. It's not clay, it's not plaster. It's not any of these things that you think about as a material for bronze. It's what you have on in the inside of you that's so important. That philosophy guided Dupin's creative work and his teaching. And this looks like maybe it was a 20 minute sketch, Father. Is that what that is? Or 10? Could be. Like 10 or 20, 10 10 or 20 minutes. Shorter. Dupin left behind a huge body of work. Most of this collection has not been shared with the public until now. You know, Father, I, one thing I wanted to This ask is a story about, about the impact of an artist's out, life uh, and the survival of an artistic uh, reputation. You just have to be the right type in order to make it. For a long time, there were only four Seattle artists that were really recognized here. There were Mark Toby, right? There were Guy Anderson, there were Kenneth Callahan, and there were Morris Graves, and nobody else seemed to count for very much. Most of us know that there are lots of people who are very good, but they, they are not known. And that's true of artists, too. No, you're okay? I'm okay. Okay, thank you. Mother, do you want to sit down? No, I'm all right. Okay. That's when fine. I want to, I'll sit down. <laughs> She's a dear woman. How are you doing? Hey, do you remember great grandpa? Hey. Did you say hi to great grandpa? Yeah. Yeah. He's heard That's a lot good. of stories about you. <laughs> well, I, I think I speak for all the artists in the room who have experienced the extraordinary generosity and the exceptional humanity of this gentleman here, who saw in all of his students something that he could get behind and nourish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> his teaching was such that he didn't want you to sculpt like him. He wanted you to sculpt like you. And he was teaching principles, not do like I do. Talk about the late 50s and early 60s when I was in graduate school with Everett. This was a time when the, the, the figure was out, which, of course, we've been hearing that for the last 50 years. You hear it until somebody does a good figure sculpture, of course. It's like the short story. The figure, the short story is dead. Well, yeah. But I think that he was a very patient um, person with the young students trying different things. I would work along with them. I would criticize them on their projects that they were taking along, doing. And uh, I wouldn't give them their projects necessarily. I would just say, look, art is not about that. Art is about what happens from you. Now do it. They would get that message. I wanted them to have more confidence in themselves when I said that because at an early age, my teachers did that for me. And uh, I really appreciate that. Everett Dupin was raised in a family that appreciated the arts. His father was a jeweler and his mother an opera singer. He was born in Chico, California in 1912. His parents took him to the San Francisco World's Fair when he was three years old. But I was lost at the Panama Pacific Exposition. Well, <laughs> my mother didn't know where I was going. <laughs> I, I was off to the pavilions, and I happened in on the sculpture pavilion, which is very nice. And I looked around, and I kind of liked what I saw, you know, these nude women, and I walked around, just round and round and round. And my mother found me 
doing exactly that. And of course, I was walloped for that, <laughs> being, you know, being lost. She didn't know where I was, she was upset. So uh, that was it, that was one of the first exposures that I had to sculpture. When my father was 14 and started in junior high, he took a craft class from a lady named Miss Susan Burgess, and that name became important to him for the rest of his life. She recognized his talent and really encouraged him. The Los Angeles paper had written a story about him being a genius in sculpture and to watch him in the future, and this was when he was 14 years old. Oh, this carving of uh, Washington here, not a very good one, but I did that anyhow when I was 13 years old. This was 16 before I got into the college, of course. Miss Burgess and my mother got together, and they figured out that since I had a, sal a talent, that I should go east. I ended up at Yale University School of Art. The Yale School of Fine Arts there. The figure was the big, big thing. So we did the figure. I liked it. I liked to do the figure because it's had so many possibilities, so many variations of possibilities and so on. My father met my mother in New York City, and she had been born and raised in Beaumont, Texas, and very bravely, I think, left Beaumont after she graduated from high school and went to New York City to become a dancer. She had a beautiful body, she was a dancer, and uh, she went and posed in the School of Art. That is how my father met my mother. However, I have been told that I'm not supposed to tell anybody that. Oh, that's Everett when I first met him. And he had that mustache, but he had to cut it off because it tickled me. <laughs> you were a good looking guy, Everett. That was the first portrait you made of me. He was a very good son, and his mother was very proud of him. And then he married that Charlotte. My mother didn't want it. She said, no, 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 not married. I want you to marry somebody else. I said, look, I am the one that's doing the marrying, not you. <laughs> we had it out. I didn't wear a wedding dress. I didn't want to do that. I went to this store and bought this bright colored dress. And this is it. My mother was quite an original. She, um, I think she always liked to shock people. And I think she continued that through her life. Um, she had a pet snake and she used to wrap it around her neck like a, a boa. And she would go on the subway in New York just to shock people. I was in the East Coast and I didn't like it. And I came back. And believe me, I'm glad I came back because it was just no place for me in the East Coast. I, I just felt it in here. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I loved being in New York very much. There was so much to do. <laughs> Seattle was the last place in all the world that I wanted to be. Everett Dupin needed a full-time job to support his growing family. The University of Washington offered him a teaching position in 1945, and the Dupin family moved to Seattle. Father was very lucky because he had an education and was able to teach at the university, but his first love was being in his studio doing his work. My dear father, he said, you're going to starve to death, son. You're going to starve to death. 
Well, I didn't starve to death, and I made a very good living from teaching. It was very unnerving that I had to be both father and sculptor. And I understood, you know, the balance between the two things, and I tried to do a job, but I'm quite sure that I didn't, the way that my wife felt that I should. But you can't help that sometimes, and uh, you just worked long in your work, what you were doing, and that's my life. Raising a family, of course. But unfortunately, that was incidental to my making sculpture. I must be honest about that and say that, because if you're a sculptor, you're a sculptor. You're not just a father. But it's wonderful to be both father and sculptor. I remember the sounds of art coming from the basement, and not just the smells of the clay, but the sounds of the chisel on the wood. And I remember all the, the debris on the floor of all these little curls, and we used to take them and kind of play with them because they were really pretty, these little round sh spoon shapes from the wood. I enjoyed it because the smells. He used to smoke a pipe, so you'd get that tobacco, the pipe tobacco smell, and then there were the woods, all those different woods, and linseed oil and clay, and it was a really fun place to be. There was a lot to look at. It was wonderful. They saw me working, and that was a good inspiration for them. What was it like when uh, we were posing? Were we cooperative? No, you were fiddling and diddling and everything else. And the pogo stick was another one. We had that pogo stick going. That was all right. <laughs>So he would walk out and he'd look at the car and look at us and he says, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Vashon. I want to stay here and work. And that's what he did. So we got out of the car. She hauled everything back in the house. We put all of our stuff away. And that was it. There was never any word to us about, oh, children, I'm so sorry this happened. No. There was no, no discussion. So that's pretty much the way it was. Everything we did was, was tailored to his needs. And it was very much like walking on eggshells to make sure that we didn't say anything that would upset him. Mother would say, now don't upset your father. I think every one of us would say we heard that many, many times. Don't upset your father. His wife, Charlotte, was his lifelong muse. We'd put the kids to bed when they were asleep. Then I would take off my clothes and he would <laughs> draw me. I posed for that. Yeah. Yeah, she did a lot of posing for me. 
He would come in and he would hug my mother and just hold on to her. And I remember just watching, this would happen night after night, where he would just hug her and then his hands would run all the way up and down her back over her bottom and back up and, and she would do the same thing on him. And then as they were in their embrace, he would tell her the problems of the day and just unload everything. He was, would get very, very depressed, very anxious, very moody, and he would come home and if there had been a conflict at the School of Art, if he didn't get along with someone, we would all hear about it. I think he felt unappreciated and uh, that's what would upset him the most. And then just kids, I mean, my God, he had four kids he was raising. Every time I was depressed, I would go down and buy tools every time. Things were difficult for him because he wanted time to create the work. He taught during the day and at four o'clock he would try to get home and immediately go down in the basement and work on his commissions and work to midnight. Many of Dupin's public commissions are still visible today. One down in Olympia. That was one of my first big commissions. Do you remember Charles Odegaard? Do you remember the bust of Charles Odegaard? Oh yeah, he was my favorite president, president of the university. I did the Century 21 fountain, and he said, it scares me. I said, hey, this thing is 70 feet long and 57 feet wide. The architect says, fill it. Now, how am I going to fill all of that space? So this was, <laughs> I didn't sleep well at that, that time particularly because it was bothering me how I was going to account for all of that space and still do it well. But I just did it. And that's the thing to be remembered. No matter how hard the job, just do it. And the answers will come to you as you work. If you ever look at the surface of one of Everett's pieces, and this is primarily the bronzes, though his wood carvings and certainly his stone carvings uh, uh, reflected the same kind of care for detail and the lovingness of surface. The surfaces really were very sensual. I think they spoke the language of touch. It's the movement and the grace of the human figure. It is classical, conventional in the sense of being figurative, but without being, you know, old-fashioned. There are certainly traces and elements of, of, of modernism in it that he's not easy to classify. I had great problems with the art commission on this. I had a diver specified for that location, and yes, they passed judgment on it, and they said, yes, we'd love the diver. And then they decided, after midstream, that they would love to have this thing standing up. And I said, no diver, I don't want to do a diver standing up. We got through with it, and I said, okay, I'll stand him up. When you look at the thing, you know, I said, well, you got to put trunks on him, because the kids will be looking at him. Well, I said, it's about time they learn a few things, isn't it? I was remembering about the casting in bronze of this particular piece, and I loved the action of it. Well, I'm glad to see him. Okay, friend. <laughs>
Well, this piece was done in 1982, and uh, I did not want to do this uh, section in bronze because I knew from the very start that it presented a great deal of engineering problem. But I was persuaded by my engineer to go ahead with it. He said it's stable enough. Both of us had not considered that Dallas is one of the windiest cities in the United States. And lo and behold, when it was installed, I could see it actually moving. I would strongly advise anybody in the sculpture to study a course in engineering, because you need it. <laughs> you have to lift things, you have to haul things, you have to use you know, drop lines, you have to use all kinds of things like this, you know. Plus, you have to know the weight and how to handle all these things. Everett Dupin retired from the University of Washington in 1982 when he turned 70. He just didn't retire. He continued to be a mentor long after his retirement with a night modeling group. He had his following, ex-students and people who uh, wanted to know what he knew and access to it. And that carried on for several years afterwards. We met every Wednesday, something like that, until I had a miniature heart attack. And I tell you, that was awful. <laughs> Dupin stayed in touch with many of his former students years after they left the university. There comes a time when you just can't do anything anymore. Hands, mm -hmm. you know, kind of pounding at things like this. You don't give it up. You don't give it up. Maybe it gives you up. I don't know. But you don't give it up knowingly. No. One way or another, you're an artist, I guess. But enough of you, Tom. This is this wonderful clay. This is the, uh, and I have to cover it, you know, is in plastic. Is this water clay? Water clay. Water clay? Mm -hmm. My goodness. I constantly think about, am I, am, I, am I pushing myself? Am I doing the best I can do? Mm. I, d I didn't want to just recreate animals as they were. I yeah. wanted to do yeah. the work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because that is what art is about. Yes, of course it is. You know, it's being experimental yeah. and yeah. trying to find... Art is knowing when to stop, but it's also knowing when to keep going, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just let it come. Yeah. That's the only way. It's the only real good thing about teaching. Mm -hmm. And tell my students, you know, to do the thing that's inwardly. Do your thing and do it. Mm -hmm. Don't fool around with it. Boy, you got good teeth, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Just watch your fingers there. I am watching them. <laughs> For goodness sakes, I haven't seen her in a long time. That's Tony Andrew. Yeah. 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 He has a lot of your sculpture tools, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, there's the guy there. They put in everything over at the University of Washington. There's a very, very thin thread of people who had information from the earlier ages and then carried it through, but Everett Dupin was one of them who kind of carried the torch through a very dark time. And now there's a resurgence in, in, in interest in the figure. It's kind of coming up everywhere. But think about how those shapes relate to the figure itself. In other words, if the figure is kind of roundish, make a roundish base. If it's kind of square to you, make a squarish base. Yes, there is a very great pressure on the part of art schools to be popular. Our market in New York City is guided by salesmanship. That's wrong to me, that's altogether wrong. And you do what you do. In sculpture, art, anything that you do in the creative field, you do what is your own feeling about things. You don't do what's out there just because it's popular. You know, we sometimes talk here as if everybody is, is concerned with how important they are in, in the rest of the world. And uh, most of the people I've met around here, except for the intellectuals, <laughs> are quite happy if they get quoted or something like that. We always like to distinguish between two fundamental aspects of reputation. One we call recognition, which is the appreciation and reputation that you have among your fellow artists. And the other element is renown, which is a question of getting out to the larger community. And high renown depends essentially on publicity. Publicity is developed through connections with critics, with dealers, with uh, wealthy collectors, and with museums. And without publicity, there is no artistic reputation. 
He was not a business person. He did not do self-promotion. In fact, most of the time he did things that hurt him. He'd made enemies. If there was a critic, he ended up not liking him and then saying things to them, and so they didn't like him. And um, he, he did not promote himself. He was not smart in that way. Particularly in the, in the 60s when all the new work was coming along, to be new was, uh, was very important. And even the, uh, the art critics were talking about the new. It had to be new. Uh, regardless of what you were doing with the figure. David Martin of the Martin Zambito Gallery showed Dupin's work in the 1990s. I could not understand why Everett didn't have a dealer because when I saw the quality of his work, it was really a lot higher than most of what I had seen. I think this is when Everett started working, uh, or at least taking a different look at um, modernism. And uh, Everett's work had been out of the public eye for, for quite a while, so it needed to be reintroduced. You know, initially, the, the things didn't sell because there were, there were few pieces to select. And really, people, the, the people that knew more about him were his students. We don't really make this actually for money. And if you do a piece like it's done for your family or yourself, it's your baby. And it has to be changed, it has to be cleaned, it has to be done. I want to be in on this, uh, on this situation completely. And many times, my, one of my pieces of sculpture was sold, and I don't know to whom. And this bothers me. This bothers me no end. And uh, so, yes, it is a difficult thing. This is how it usually went, okay. We would pick out a few pieces, maybe three or four. He'd say, well, I could part with this, or, you know, I have something that's similar to this, and I think this is a nice piece to go out. But we, we would take the pieces to the gallery and then give them a few days to think about pricing them. And then the calls would start coming. I always wanted to keep the art in the family. And I did not want to sell any of it. She, was, she just did not like to part with any little teeny thing that he had done, even these little maquettes, you know, and she would want three quarters of the stuff back. She would be constantly <laughs> changing the prices and, you know, asking for things to come back. Well, at that time, it would not have cost very much. I couldn't get much for it. And to me, it was more important to have it than to have a few more dollars. After all, I could make the dollars in the stock market. She really wanted to keep the work for herself. She didn't like to see it go out in the world, right? Which is just, just uh, the opposite of what it should be doing. It should be going out in the world. We have a collection of family art that we can put together um, that is huge, two to three hundred pieces of his work. Not anything is lost really because you have to leave behind enough of a body of work, you know, so that people will find it and that something will happen with it. There's some artists who did not get to be as well known as they should and they cannot have their reputations revived because there's nothing to revive them with, right? He left a great body of work, he left good kids, and he left a bunch of good students who still think highly of him and continue to do the work. Um, can't, can't ask for anything more than that. It would be nice if Everett at least had his day of recognition that he hasn't had.